So today I'm going to talk about the reciprocal <laughs> lattice, okay, and how it relates to diffraction. And I'll begin by introducing uh, vectors. Uh, this is a vector u. You can see from the origin to the opposite corner. And we describe the vector in terms of a reference frame, which in the case of a unit cell uh, are the basis vectors, a1, a2, and a3. And the components of the vector along uh, those basis vectors are u1, u2, and u3. And we express the indices of a direction by writing those components in square brackets, either as a row vector or as a column vector. So in real space, basically the components of a vector with respect to the basis vector define the Miller indices of that direction. <coughs> and sometimes we need to do operations on vectors and it's important to realize that vectors are physical quantities. Uh, they point in a certain direction and they have a certain magnitude and it doesn't matter what the frame of reference is, that vector is the same vector. It might have different components when you change the frame of reference, but it's still pointing in the same direction and has the same magnitude u. Now, if I define a unit vector, that means a vector which has a magnitude of just one, so the symbol on top of that vector v, the hat, identifies that it is a unit vector. And this is my vector u. And if I take a dot product, then that simply gives me the projection of the vector u along the direction v. So the magnitude of u times cosine of the angle theta, and assuming this is of unit length, the dot product between u and v hat gives me the projection. That means this distance here of u along the direction v. Okay, so that's a dot product. And notice that this is a scalar quantity. It's just a number, okay? A cross product, on the other hand, actually leads to a vector. So here I have uh, two vectors, a1 and a2. And when I take a cross product, a right-handed cross product, so I start with a1, and then go to A2, I get another vector, A3. And the magnitude of the vector A3 is A1 times A2 times sine of the angle between A1 and A2. And this is a unit vector which is pointing at 90 degrees to both A1 and A2. So A3 hat is normal to A1 and A2. And if you think about it, A1, A2, sine theta is simply the area of the plane that is enclosed by A1 and A2, okay? So it's the area of the plane enclosed by A1 and A2, and A3 hat here is at 90 degrees to that plane. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so we've already said that the vector, uh, the cross product of A2 and A3 will define the area of this plane and result in a vector which is at 90 degrees to that plane. So here we have three vectors, A2, A3, and A1, which define a unit cell. Okay. I haven't uh, defined any of the angles, etc. so it's a general unit cell. And this vector is a unit vector because it's A2 cross A3 divided by the magnitude of A2 cross A3. Yeah. So here, I'm simply drawing a unit vector which is at 90 degrees to this basal plane. Yeah. Everyone happy with that? What I want to show is that if I take the dot product of A1 with A2 cross A3, then I get a certain quantity which will be a scalar, right? Does anybody know what that quantity will be? A1 dot A2 cross A3. So remember that A2 cross A3, the magnitude of that will be the area of the plane. Yeah. So we've got the area of the plane. If I take A1 dot A2 cross A3, 
then basically I'm taking the projection of A1 along the vertical direction, which is at 90 degrees to the plane. In other words, A1 <coughs> dotted with a unit vector at 90 degrees to these will simply give me the height of this polygon, right? So height times the area gives me the volume, right? Right, so we define for every unit cell in real space, we define a reciprocal unit cell where A1 star, the star refers to a reciprocal lattice vector, which is equal to A2 cross A3 divided by the volume of the cell. Okay. So what will be the units of A1 star? Just like A1 has units of meters, what will be the units of A1 star? Sorry? Yeah, it's meters to the minus one, one upon a distance, okay? Uh, so the magnitude of A1 star will be the spacing of the planes defined by A1 and A2. So if I go back to this, the magnitude of A1 star is simply this height here, okay? Therefore, A1 star points at 90 degrees to the plane defined by A2 and A3 and has a magnitude which is 1 upon the spacing of these planes. Okay? And similarly, A2 star is at 90 degrees to A3 and A1 and has a magnitude which is the spacing of these planes and A3 star which is <coughs> similarly defined. Now obviously the order in which we do this dot product is not important, yeah? If I had, you know, A2 dot A3 cross A1, that would be the same because it's still defining the volume of the cell, right? Okay, so this is a definition of a reciprocal lattice uh, unit cell corresponding to every real space unit cell. Happy with that? Okay. So now you'll begin to understand why in Miller indices we take the intercept of a plane and then we take the reciprocal of those intercepts to define the Miller indices of a plane because those are the components of a vector in reciprocal space. And the magnitude of that vector is one upon the spacing of the HKL planes and it points at 90 degrees to those planes. Right, so I'm not sure why I've got that slide because it's the same thing except instead of having a unit vector uh, normal to A2 and A3, this is now the one upon the spacing of these planes, okay? Right, now in the case of a cubic unit cell, the reciprocal lattice vectors will point in the same directions as the real space let, uh, unit cell vectors, okay? But that is not generally true. Uh, as soon as you go away from uh, an orthogonal cell, that means where the angles are all 90 degrees, the reciprocal lattice vectors will no longer be parallel to the real space vectors. You've already come across this. When we were looking at the hexagonal system, you saw that the 0, 0, 1 direction, uh, sorry, 1, 0, 0 direction is not parallel to the 1, 0, 0 plane normal. Do you remember that? Similarly, here I've got an oblique cell uh, where this is A1 and this is A2. A1 star must point at 90 degrees to this plane here. Okay? And therefore, A1 star is not parallel to A1. And similarly, A2 star must point at 90 degrees to these planes and therefore it's not parallel to A2. So, just to summarize, a reciprocal lattice vector is normal to a plane and its magnitude is 1 upon d, where d is the spacing of those planes. Now, uh, let me just – so we've got that A1 star. A1 
star is equal to A2 cross A3 over the volume, right? So what happens if I take A1 dot A1 star? A1 dot A1, sorry about the writing here, okay? So A1 star is A2 cross A3 divided by the volume of the cell. What happens if I take a dot product with this? Yeah, it's one, isn't it? Because A1 dot A2 cross A3 is simply the volume of the cell, okay? So this will be equal to one. And what if I take uh, A2 dot A2 cross A3? Okay, so in, in other words, if I take A1 star dot A2, Yeah, so what's A2 dot A2 cross A3? Any ideas? Yeah, because you're right, it's zero. Because A2 cross A3 gives you a vector at 90 degrees to A2, doesn't it? So a dot product between two vectors which are at 90 degrees is zero because cos of 90 is zero, okay? So when these two indices are identical here, i equals j, the dot product will be one and when they are not identical, the dot product will be zero. Right, so you recall the Weiss zone rule where if I have a direction u, v, w and a plane normal h, k, l, if that direction lies in that plane, then this sum will be equal to zero. Okay, so that's the, the Weiss zone rule. We can now prove that. If I take a dot product between the real space vector u, uh, u, v, w and a reciprocal space vector a star, B star, C star, okay? Then U A star, uh, U A dot H A star is what? Uh, it's U H, right? What's U A dot A B star? Zero, because, you know, A dot B star, and B star is uh, at uh, 90 degrees to A, and therefore that product is zero, and similarly this product is zero, so we recover only the term UH when we do a dot product with UA. Similarly, VB will only have a, uh, a component, U, um, sorry, VB dot KB star will be UVK, uh, but all other products will be zero, and so on. So we've proven the Weiss zone rule, and I haven't defined the vectors A, B, or C. They could be anything pointing in any non-coplanar -co directions, right? So this rule applies to whatever your crystal system is, whether it's monoclinic or cubic or hexagonal, whatever it is. If U, V, W, uh, if U, H plus V, K plus W, L is zero, then the direction U, V, W lies in the plane H, K, L, okay? So no need for you to do any geometry, et cetera. This dot product proves the Weiss zone rule directly. Okay, so here's our, our stereogram. And on a stereogram, we plot plane normals. Do you remember we put the crystal in the middle of a sphere? We took its normal, where it intersected the sphere, we projected it through the south pole, and that gives us, gives us a pole. A pole is basically a plane normal. And wh what I'm going to do now is to plot uh, the reciprocal lattice section, which is normal to zero, zero, 001, okay? So 
if I'm looking at the plane which is normal to zero, zero, 001, which is pointing out of the out of the board, then all the poles lying on this great circle, which are at 90 degrees to the zero, zero, 001 direction, will appear on my reciprocal lattice vector uh, zone. So how do I do this? Well, we follow the rule that if I can identify two vectors in that reciprocal lattice section, then all the others are straightforward. Yeah. So let me pick two convenient vectors. If I plot uh, 1, 0, 0, and then 0, 1, 0, then all the others should follow just by linear combinations. So only the poles lying on that red circle will appear in my reciprocal lattice section. So here it is. This is a cubic P, and it's a section of the reciprocal lattice normal to 0, 0, 1. So I've got 1, 0, 0, and I've got 0, 1, 0. Just convenient poles which are identified from the stereogram. All the others are a linear combination. So for example, this is the sum of this and this. This is the sum of this and this, and so on. If I look opposite, then obviously the signs, you know, one is the negative direction, uh, pole of the other, right? So this is 0, 1, 0, and 0, bar 1, 0. This is bar 1, 1, 0, and here we have 1, bar 1, 0. So this is the reciprocal lattice section, just like we have, you know, if we are looking at a real lattice, we have lattice points. These are reciprocal lattice points. And each vector on here is at 90 degrees to the plane, and its spacing, uh, its magnitude is one upon the spacing of those planes. Okay. So this vector here, for example, is the normal to the one bar one zero plane, and its spacing will be one upon, uh, its magnitude will be one upon the spacing of those planes. Yeah. Now. Which do you think has a larger spacing, the one zero zero planes or the one bar one zero plane? Which planes are more widely spaced, one zero zero or the one bar one zero? Yeah, because remember it's reciprocal. Yeah, so the spacing, uh, the magnitude here is one upon the spacing. So planes which are spaced far apart will be nearer to the origin of the lattice, okay? The reciprocal lattice points will be nearer to the origin. So when, for example, you look in your electron diffraction pattern, uh, you're looking at reciprocal lattice vectors, and a spot <coughs> which is close to the origin, the transmitted beam, represents planes which have a larger despacing. So carbide spots, for example, usually come nearer to the center because carbides have large lattice parameters compared with things like ferrite or austenite, okay? Uh, of course, this is just primitive cubic here. Yeah? Right, now, if you wanted to plot the reciprocal lattice uh, section for the 110 direction, okay? So all the poles normal to 110, then this would be the great circle that I would focus on, right? So to start constructing that, uh, I need to pick again two convenient poles. Here we have uh, zero, zero, 001 and 1 bar 10. One and I'm picking them because they're at 90 degrees to each other, so it makes it easier for me to draw the reciprocal lattice section, okay? So zero, zero, 001 and 1 bar 10. Where's the pen gone? Ah. So, supposing I start by plotting zero, zero, 001, okay? Now, I've got to plot 1 bar 10 at 90 degrees to that. Will it be closer to the origin or further from the origin? So this is my origin, okay? And I've already drawn the zero, zero, 001. And I want to draw 1 bar 10. 
I know it's at 90 degrees to this. Any ideas? Closer or further away from the origin than the zero, zero, 001? Yep. Further, yeah. So I, I, I draw it longer in proportion to the spacing of the uh, 1 bar 1, 0. And where will the 1 bar 1, 1 be? Well, it'll be here. Oops. Okay, so this is now the 1 bar 1, 1. Well, yeah. Okay. Everyone happy with that? So that is the 1 bar 1, 1. I didn't need to measure any angles, etc. I just added up this and this to get me the 1 bar 1, 1. Okay? So that's the reciprocal lattice section normal to 1, 1, 0 for the primitive cubic unit cell. And if you had a primitive cubic material, this is what an electron diffraction pattern <coughs> with the electron beam coming along the 110 direction would look like. Okay? Of course, um, this is just a lattice. Uh, it's, these are imaginary points. I haven't got any intensities on here as yet. We have to go uh, on further to see what the intensities of these reflections would be. But this is the reciprocal lattice. Okay, now we plot the 111 reciprocal lattice section. So I identify the great circle which is at 90 degrees to 111. So all of these points here lie at 90 degrees to 111. Uh, you, can, you can check that by taking a dot product between any of those, and you will see that you get a zero. So, for example, 111 dotted with 0 bar 11 is obviously zero because 1 times 0 is 0, 1 times minus 1 is minus 1, and 1 times 1 is 1, therefore is zero. Yeah? So that great circle gives you all the poles which are lying at 90 degrees to 111, and that is what will appear on the reciprocal lattice section normal to one on one. So what will that pattern look like? What will the shape of that pattern, roughly? Yeah. Notice these are all crystallographically equivalent. Yeah. So the distance from the origin will be identical for all those. Right? What about angles? So this is exactly opposite this, right? So just divide the angle by three. What do you get? 60, right? And here is what that section would look like. We have the poles at 60 degrees to each other, okay? So it's quite easy, once you have your stereogram, to plot the reciprocal lattice sections normal to any particular direction. You just identify the great circle which is at 90 degrees to any given pole. Okay, uh, I'm going to derive for you the Bragg law in a very simple way. Okay, the Bragg equation everybody is familiar with, that 2D sine theta equals n lambda gives you diffracted intensity, but if you deviate from the Bragg angle, then you get zero intensity. And I want you to understand why, why that law works. So imagine that we've got a set of planes here, and the spacing <coughs> of those planes is D, and you've got your X-ray or electrons or whatever coming in at a particular angle theta then all, the, all these beams which hit the top layer 
are traveling exactly the same distance. Yeah? So you start from here and you reach this point here, add up this distance, that's exactly the same as this distance here. Right? Therefore, these are in phase. Yeah? The peaks of the waves coincide with the peaks of the other wave and they reinforce. Okay. Uh, this, on the other hand, has a path difference which is PO and OQ different from this beam here. Right. It's traveling an extra distance PO plus OQ compared with this beam here. So this will be out of phase with anything being reflected from this layer here and if that path difference here which is 2D times sine theta, the D is the distance between the planes and this is the angle theta and this is also the angle theta, PO plus OQ is 2D sine theta. If that's an integral number of wavelengths, N is an integer and lambda is a wavelength, if the path difference is an integral number of wavelengths then these two will reinforce and you get diffraction. But if it's not, then you will get destructive interference. If it's half a wavelength out of phase, you'll get destructive interference, right? Now, supposing that we deviate from the Bragg angle theta where this equation is satisfied, okay? So the Bragg angle is the angle where this equation is satisfied. Supposing we deviate by a small amount from the angle theta, then as I go deeper and deeper into the crystal, I will eventually be able to find a wave which is exactly half a wavelength out of phase and you'll get destructive interference. Okay. But if the Bragg law is satisfied, I never reach that condition. I will get diffracted intensity. So the important thing is that the Bragg law applies for a crystal which is infinitely thick. Uh, you have to be able to go deep into the material to find another wave which will be half a wavelength out of phase when you deviate from the angle theta. The greater the, uh, the smaller the deviation, the deeper you have to go into the crystal. So if you are dealing with a thin foil, then the Bragg law will not be exactly satisfied. Even though you are not at the angle theta, you will get diffracted intensity because there's nothing underneath the thin foil to find a beam which is half a wavelength out of phase, okay? So the Bragg law strictly applies for an infinitely thick crystal. When you look at very, very small crystals, your beam, your diffracted beam will have a certain width. You know, otherwise you should only get a single point at the angle theta where all the intensity is concentrated, right? So this is why when you're looking at small crystals, the diffracted intensity is spread out, not just at theta, but around <coughs> theta as well. Same applies to X-ray diffraction, where when you're looking at very small crystals, you will get the beam being wider. Okay, so that's a crystal size effect. Okay, so uh, this is just illustrating uh, the beam from the upper layer here, and these two are in exactly uh, phase because they travel the same distance, but this one is out of phase by this extra interval P O O Q, which when that is equal to uh, that is equal to two d sine theta. If that's an integral number of wavelengths, then you will get diffraction. Now, just to give you an idea of the wavelength of electrons. Uh, electrons, typical um, accelerating voltage in an electron microscope is about 100 kilo electron volts. The wavelength would be very, very small. Okay? So that's 0 0.0037 of a nanometer. And if the spacing, typical spacing of planes in a crystalline material is 0 0.2 nanometers, then the Bragg angle is very, very small, half a degree in your electron microscope, the Bragg angles will be much smaller than when you do X-ray diffraction because the typical wavelength of an X-ray is about 0.15 of a nanometer. Okay. 
So in a transmission electron microscope, when you see an incident beam and a diffracted beam, the angle there is, you know, almost zero, the angle between the diffracted beam and the incident beam. Okay, so that's quite important to remember. And if I draw uh, a sphere which has uh, a diameter one upon the wavelength here, so this is a sphere and its diameter is, uh, uh, sorry, its radius is one upon the wavelength. So K, K and K dashed represent reciprocal lattice vectors whose magnitudes are one upon lambda, okay, one upon the wavelength here. And G, normally we, in a diffraction pattern, we call a reciprocal lattice vector a G vector, right? So it's just another name for a reciprocal lattice vector, which has the same meaning that it points normal to the planes doing the diffracting, and the magnitude is one upon d. So I've drawn a sphere here, which has the radius one upon lambda. Okay, so k is pointing along the incident beam, and k dashed is pointing along the diffracted beam, and g represents the planes which are doing the diffracting. Okay, so it's normal to the planes doing the diffracting. And this is the or origin of the reciprocal lattice. This is a vector representation of the Bragg law. Okay, because uh, just from uh, the geometry here, you can write that k dashed minus g, that means going in this direction, is the same as k. So this is just a vector equation representing this triangle here. Okay. Now, all you have to do is substitute one upon lambda here, one upon lambda here, and one upon d here. And from this equation, uh, from this uh, triangle, you can see that sine theta is equal to half of g, that means this distance here, uh, divided by d, divided by k. Yeah, it's an isosceles triangle. k and k dashed are equal because we are only talking about elastic scattering. That means the wavelength doesn't change during diffraction. Okay? So if k and k dashed are equal and the angle between k and k dashed is 2 theta, uh, you can see that in the, yeah, the angle between the incident beam and the diffracted beam is 2 theta here. Just drop a vertical line here and you'll see that sine of theta opposite over hypotenuse is half g divided by k, right? Substitute for g, one upon d, and substitute for k, one upon lambda, and we've got the Bragg law, okay? So this is a vector representation of the Bragg law. Given that two theta is very, very small, yeah, it's, a, it's approximately one, degree, 2 theta. Uh, this angle here is almost 90 degrees, right? So when we look in a diffraction pattern, we are looking on this plane here, and the incident beam is almost at 90 degrees to that reciprocal lattice section. Right, so here now I've got that sphere which we call the aval sphere. It's got a radius which is one upon lambda superimposed on the reciprocal lattice section here. And this is the origin of the reciprocal lattice. This is the direction of the incident beam, the direction of the diffracted beam. And if the vector K dashed ends on a reciprocal lattice point, then this is the set of planes which satisfy the Bragg condition. This would not satisfy the Bragg condition. Okay. So by putting this Eva sphere onto my reciprocal lattice section, I can identify which planes are going to give me diffraction. Yeah. So we proved that the Bragg law is satisfied when k, this is k, this is k dashed, and k dash touches a reciprocal lattice point. This would not satisfy the Bragg condition, this would, and so on, okay? So the Eval sphere construction helps you to identify which planes are going to give you diffraction. 
And here we are using a monochromatic uh, wavelength. Now supposing you are using white x-rays, you know, that means a range of wavelengths. Then say this is the minimum wavelength here, one upon that. And then if I have a smaller wavelength, I would have a larger sphere here. And anything falling between the minimum and maximum radii would contribute to diffraction. Okay. So when we put white x-rays onto a material, there's a range of wavelengths and therefore you will have two spheres and every point enclosed within that sphere will give you diffraction. So it's obviously easier to get to diffraction conditions when you have white x-rays. Everyone happy with that? About sphere construction? Now, in this diagram, we've got the incident beam coming along a particular direction and the crystal is fixed. But often you do diffraction experiments where you rotate the crystal, right? You know, you, you, you put it into your X-ray diffractometer and it's going round and round. The specimen is going round and round. So all you have to do is you have to rotate the reciprocal lattice uh, itself and every time that one of these intersects the sphere, you will get a diffracted beam. So you can represent all kinds of diffraction experiments by taking the EVA sphere and superimposing it onto a reciprocal lattice. Okay, now, so far I've just talked about the lattice, which is an imaginary object, you know, it doesn't really exist. Uh, once we start putting um, uh, atoms and so forth onto the lattice, that's when we get actual intensity from diffraction. And let's imagine that we've got a cubic P lattice, then everything is possible because we only have atoms at the corners of the cell if there is one atom per lattice point. But when we get to, say, a cubic F, uh, we've got atoms also in the middle of the cell, okay? And at, uh, sorry, this is at the face centers, the middle of the faces. Now, if I look at the one zero zero planes here, I've got another set of objects in the middle of the one zero zero planes, which will scatter X-rays or electrons exactly half a wavelength out of phase. So in this case, the 100 reflection will not appear for cubic F. Okay? It will have zero intensity. So my diffraction pattern here, where I have 100, will no longer have a 100. 200 are the planes with half the spacing of 100. There's nothing in between to scatter an antiphase wave. And therefore, the reflection that I get is 200. 100 reflections are systematically absent if you have a cubic F lattice. Okay? So here, notice this is 200 and not 100. In this case, the symmetry of the pattern is still exactly the same. So the only way you recognize that it's 200 is by measuring the D spacing. Yeah. Is everyone happy with that? So I've shown you in a simple way why the 100 reflection is missing. We've got a set of scattering centers halfway, which will scatter half a wavelength out of phase, and therefore you do not get to zero, zero. Similarly, these are the 110 planes. Okay? If I look at the 110 planes in the cubic F, then I've got another set here, and therefore I do not get 110, but I get 220. Everyone happy with that? This is a, a case uh, where we are looking at the 110 um, direction, beam direction. And this is what we had earlier for the cubic P. But we've already said that we do not get 110 reflections here because look, if this is the 110 plane, we've also got another set of scattering centers in between. Okay, so instead of 110, we've got to get 220 and 220 will come 
uh, double the spacing here, so it will come somewhere there. Okay. Similarly, we do not get 0, 0, 001, we've got 0, 0, 002. Okay. So 0, 0, 002 and 2 bar 2, 0 is somewhere there. If I combine these two, then I will get a 2, 2, 2 here and a 1, 1, 1 here. Okay. So now the shape of the pattern looks different because of the specific reflections which are missing. Yeah. So here you have a distorted hexagon whereas this is a, a rectangle even though both of them represent 110 one, zones. Okay. If I go back to my uh, stereogram There's your 111 which we saw on the uh, pattern and the 110 and 001 which in the case of cubic F would be 002 and 220. Okay. Now this is uh, looking at the 111 beam direction or, or zone axis and both the patterns have similar symmetry, but instead of one one ones we have now two two O type reflections. Okay. Now supposing uh, that I asked you do we get a one two three reflection? Then it's hard to look at the shape of the unit cell and decide that, right? It's too difficult. Or or a one two five reflection, will that appear in cubic F? So the basic principle is that if, you, if there are scattering centers inside your unit cell which scatter out of phase, then you will not get that reflection. And the way you can express that mathematically is to add up the waves coming from different regions of the unit cell. Right? So this is called a structure factor for a particular plane HKL. And our unit cell has a certain number of atoms, which is N atoms. So if it is uh, primitive cubic, we have, and the motif is just one atom, then we have just one atom in the cell. If it's cubic F and the motif is just one atom per lattice point, then we have four atoms in the cell, so N would be four. And this is the scattering power of the atom. It's an atomic scattering factor. Okay? So you shine some rays onto that atom and then it scatters them and what is the ratio of the intensities of the scattered and incident beam. So this is the scattering power of an atom. It will vary depending on the atomic number. And this is just uh, an expression for a wave. So in this, uh, I is the square root of uh, minus one. Uh, HKL are the indices of the plane which we are trying to uh, probe. and these are the coordinates of the atom inside the unit cell. Okay? For, for each one of those atoms, we have a set of coordinates. And this is just to show you that if I have an odd number here, then exponential of 3 pi i or pi i is minus 1, whereas if I have an even number here, then it's plus 1. Okay? Now, here is our cubic F cell and let's say we have copper, so there's a copper atom at each lattice point. And the atoms are located, the coordinates of the atoms are 0, 0, 0 and then at the face center, so half, half, zero, half, zero, half and so on. So all I have to do is write the expression for the structure factor in terms of a single uh, copper atomic scattering factor. Uh, when I substitute 0, 0, 0 into this, it's just exponential 2 pi i into 0 and exponential of 0 is 1. Okay, so I get a 1 here. Uh, when I take half, half 0, I will have uh, h upon 2, k upon 2 and 0 and therefore I get this term. I've now lost the 2 because it was h upon 2. Yeah, everyone happy with that? And similarly for half, not half and not half, half. So this is now the structure factor for our copper 
and if I substitute any plane into this, then I will get whether we should get a reflection from that plane or not. So supposing I substitute 1, 0, 0, HKL equals 1, 0, 0, then I have 1, this will be exponential pi i because it's 1, 0, 0. This will be exponential pi i and this will be exponential of 0. So what's the sum there? Well, it's 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1. So I do not get anything from the 1, 0, 0 planes. Yeah. Happy with that? So this allows you to calculate intensities from any particular plane. And what we are doing is we are adding up the waves coming from each of the scattering centers and taking account of their phases. So this summation represents the adding up of all the waves coming from different locations in the cell, adding them up and seeing whether they interfered destructively or constructively. So let's imagine that we have uh, our cubic F unit cell and the structure of silicon is exactly like the structure of uh, diamond, carbon diamond, uh, that you have a silicon atom at zero, 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 and a silicon atom at a quarter, 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 and we construct that by placing that motif on every single lattice point. So here is the first motif and so on. So this is the structure of silicon. And we can start to ask questions now. How will this differ from, say, the structure of copper in terms of X-ray intensities or electron beam intensities? Whoops. Yeah. So focus again on our equation that the structure factor is basically the summation of all the scattered waves from all the scattering centers. I now have eight atoms in the cell yeah, because the motif consists of two atoms. There's a silicon at zero, 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 and a silicon at a quarter, quarter, quarter. So I have to have eight terms for this equation here. Okay. The uh, first term will be the zero, zero, zero position, and then we have the face centers, and then we have the locations at a quarter, three quarters, quarter, and three quarters. So I have now four ter uh, four eight terms in my structure factor equation. Yeah. If these atoms were not all identical, then I would have to include scattering factors at the different, before the different exponentials. Now, that's quite a cumbersome equation. Uh, supposing you had 10 atoms per lattice point, okay? So here's that equation again with eight atoms per lattice point. If you think about it, this is exactly equivalent to this, where we first write a term due to the structure factor of the lattice points and multiply by a term due to the motif. That will give you exactly the eight terms that is in the equation at the top. Okay. So this, this is a much simpler way of looking at it. You've got a structure factor component coming from the lattice points and a structure factor component coming from the motif. You multiply these two and you get the eight terms that you have in the top equation. Okay. So that makes it a lot simpler to interpret as long as all of the scattering centers are identical. Okay, so I'm now going to substitute uh, numbers into this to see whether I get a one zero zero reflection. So if I substitute for HKL as one zero zero, then I get this expression here, uh, one and one zero zero um, would give me uh, this term. 1, 0, 0 would give me this term, and 1, 0, 0 would give me this term, okay? And the motif is at 0, 0, 0, and a quarter, 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 okay? So I get an equation which looks like this. This is equal to 1, this is equal to 1, this is minus 1, and this is minus 1. So that means the intensity from the 0, 0, 1 plane will be nothing. So we expected that because, look, this is the 100 plane and halfway we've got scattering centers which would 
scatter exactly half a wavelength out of phase, okay? Okay, let's look at the 200 zero zero reflection. So instead of substituting uh, substituting one zero zero one, I substitute zero zero two. So this will be exponential of zero. Again, this will be exponential. Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. This will be exponential of two because L is two, right? So I've got two over here. And similarly, I've got L over here, so this is exponential 2. And instead of 1, we have a 2. Now, this is 1. This is 1. No, this is minus 1. Sorry, no, this is 1 as well. This is uh, 1 because it's even. And this is 1. Here we have 1. What is this? Minus 1. Therefore, we do not get a reflection from 0, 0, 2. And again, you see that, look, here we have the 0, 0, 2 planes and halfway between we've got scattering centers which will be out of phase, right? So with the diamond structure, you also do not get a 0, 0, 2 reflection. Let's see for 0, 0, 4. So this time, this will be even, okay? And therefore, you will pick up a 0, 0, 004 reflection, which is for this set of planes. Okay? So you can distinguish a diamond structure from a copper structure because you do not get a 0, 0, 002 or a 0, 0, 001 reflection. Everyone happy with that? Now I'm using simple planes here only to illustrate uh, by looking at this diagram, but you can substitute any plane into that equation that uh, you like to calculate the structure, uh, intensity. Actually, these are amplitudes. So now I'm going to look at gallium nitride structure where we have two different kinds of atoms. So you've got a gallium atom at zero, 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 and a nitrogen atom at a quarter, quarter, quarter. So it's similar to what we did before. It's cubic F, but the motif now consists of a gallium atom there and a nitrogen atom there. Now I definitely need eight separate terms because the atoms are no longer uh, identical and I can't simplify the equation as we did with the lattice times the motif. So I have here the four gallium terms corresponding to the uh, atoms at the corner and at the face centers and I have four nitrogen terms corresponding to these over here. Now, the gallium terms, um, if I substitute for the zero, zero, 001 plane, this will come to zero. Because look, it's 1 plus 1 minus 1 minus 1. And that's obvious that the gallium atoms, for zero, zero, 001, we've got another set of gallium atoms in the middle, which will be out of phase. Now, exponential of pi i is minus 1. So exponential of pi i upon 2 will be i because it's the square root of minus 1. Yeah? So these are exponential of pi i upon 2. And because of that, I get my structure factor as a complex number i into the scattering power of the nitrogen atom. But remember that f is giving you an amplitude. And in order to get an intensity, it's really f, f star, where f and f star, you know, the complex number and its conjugate. So if you have uh, a complex number, so if I have a plus i into b, okay. then that will give me a squared plus b squared. So this is a complex number and it's conjugate, okay? So when I do f f star, I get the intensity is really coming only from the nitrogen atoms for the 100 zero zero planes. 
proportional to uh, the scattering power of the nitrogen atoms. Okay. So whenever we get a complex number, you just multiply it by its conjugate, and you get the intensity as opposed to the amplitude. So f itself can be complex; it can be a negative number, but f f star will always be a real number. <coughs> so you know this is quite quite uh, a useful thing to know, uh, which you know if you're doing any crystallography at all and diffraction then you need to be able to calculate intensities, uh, not just these spacings and uh, the directions of the plane normals. All your texture measurements and interpretation of that, all that relies on these structure factors. Now, I pointed out to you that the Bragg law applies to crystals which are infinitely thick if you only want diffraction at the angle theta. As soon as you start making the crystal thinner, uh, you will get diffraction even though you are not at exactly the Bragg condition. So when we use thin foils in a transmission electron microscope, that's obviously not an infinitely thick crystal. And even though the Eval sphere doesn't intersect uh, these spots exactly, you will get diffraction, okay? Because you can think about each reciprocal lattice point as being extended normal to the plane of the foil, okay? As the foil becomes thicker, this spike becomes narrower and becomes a point if your crystal is very thick. So even though the Bragg condition may not be exactly satisfied here, in other words, uh, k dash minus k does not equal g, you will get diffraction. Okay? So in the electron microscope, it's very easy to get diffraction. Whereas when you do X-ray diffraction, you're looking at thicker crystals, and you have to set it up accurately in order to get diffraction. Uh, otherwise, you use uh, a powder or something like that so that you present many, many orientations to the X-ray beam. And remember also that the reciprocal lattice is a three-dimensional lattice. And the avasphere construction that we considered before was just looking at one layer of the reciprocal lattice. But you can set up conditions in the transmission electron microscope where the curvature of the avasphere is such that you will also intersect another layer and then you get this ring corresponding to diffraction from the second layer. Now this is very, very good because that gives you three-dimensional information on diffraction, not just one layer. Yeah? So you remember when we had the 1-1-1 uh, diffraction patterns from the cubic P? Here, you see, I cannot distinguish these two, really, just by looking at it in the microscope. But if I had another layer to look at, you would be able to solve between the cubic F and the cubic I. Okay? So, this is coming from the first layer of the reciprocal lattice, and this, uh, this information is coming from the second layer. So you can also determine this distance here by looking at the radii of those rings. This is to show you the thickness effect, that if I make my crystal thinner, then there's a greater chance of satisfying, uh, not satisfying Bragg condition, but greater chance of picking up diffracted beams simply because the reciprocal lattice point effectively becomes extended more as you make your specimen thinner. So this is when we have a 100 nanometer thick foil. I only pick up these spots. If I reduce the thickness to 20 nanometers, I get a lot more spots because you can imagine each reciprocal lattice point as being extended normal to the plane of the foil.
this is just to show you that if the avasphere intersects the origin symmetrically, then you pick up spots on both sides. But if you tilt the beam away from 111, so this is tilted, then you will intersect one side more than the other and therefore you get a pattern which looks a little bit strange. Okay? So here you are not satisfying the Bragg condition, here you are. Okay? Just tilting the eval sphere relative to the reciprocal lattice. And this, this kind of an effect that you see in diffraction patterns, which is streaking, is because these precipitates are thin. Okay? So if you have thin precipitates, then again, uh, effectively, you get diffraction over a large value of theta. Right? So these are incredibly thin precipitates, and therefore, instead of getting a spot, 